chatted uh, about kind of kicking off being a man of virtue and a culture of vice, really talked about that that men is a gospel issue, specifically fathers. In fact, the last two verses of the Old Testament, uh, when uh, the Old Testament closed, it was a promise uh, of to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and children to their fathers. And then we saw in the Gospel of Luke 400 years later that his whole preparation of the gospel before jesus came he prepared the hearts of the fathers to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and children to the father so it's really important and critical to invest in men this is why what phil's doing here is important this is why at your churches you have to ensure that you invest in the men uh the that that is everything the enemy has done everything he can to to, as a sniper to take out uh, fathers. And this is why we have so many issues uh, in the family today. That is biblical sociology. <clears throat> the only institution created before the fall was the family. There was no government. There was nothing. There was the family. And fathers are critical. So as you take a look at these virtues, there are seven virtues that are a success uh, for every man. No matter what your cultural background, no matter where you live in the world, these virtues are are the key to being a man. In fact, the Latin root virtus, where we get virtue, and it's tied into the Corne Greek New Testament word arete, it literally means manliness. So if you want to know what being a man is, you look at these virtues. These virtues aren't something I made up and came up with. They are from the Bible. They are all throughout the Old and New Testament. Uh, the, the cardinal virtues, those first four, fortitude, prudence, temperance, and justice, are discoverable by by natural man. Uh, Aristotle uh, saw them. Plato, you, our founding fathers talked about these. This is part of what God sowed into our hearts. We know these things. Sociologists have proved this. We've seen that the study by Donald Brown called Human Universals talks about the fact that there's not one culture that had that, that celebrated uh, cowardice, right? It was always uh, celebrating courage. Now, what courage means and all that, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit different. It shows the, the fallenness of man. And then in Christian men, every Christian man, you see this faith, hope, and charity. These are theological virtues. And we see these kind of, as the Holy Spirit kind of takes uh, on uh, and, and kind of comes into our lives, we can express these, <clears throat> these virtues of faith, hope, and charity. In fact, they per help perfect the other virtues. The Bible has these seven uh, unpacked. And remember I said, if you look at the vices, <laughs> Because we're fallen, the vices are, are key to helping us understand the virtues. They're kind of what come natural to us, unfortunately. Uh, it's like weeds in our yard, I use the example of. Weeds, nobody plants weeds. <clears throat> weeds just come, right? You have to work hard to pull out those weeds. And it's the same thing with our soul. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have to work hard to unpack these virtues in our soul. This is what we're to strive for. And this is the goal to aim at. So today we're going to talk about the virtue of uh, faith. And unfortunately, we have kind of an unbiblical view of faith. So let's talk about uh, faith and let's define our term. So faith, it comes from the Greek word pistis, and it literally means a deep personal belief and trust in God and his word it leads to desire for obedience and a will of conformity to his design and purpose. The properties of faith are where you have these, they're called some people call them sub, sub virtues, but what were they really are? These properties are how virtue is expressed in life. For example, faith is expressed through obedience, trust, you know, wisdom, zeal, and passion. What's really interesting is wisdom is a shared property between faith and prudence. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that will kind of come uh, out today and prudence we'll talk about next week. Well, the properties are uncertainty, the things that naturally come, pride. When our, or when our beliefs are challenged, all of a sudden pride kicks in. Uh, disobedience, uh, ignorance, we kind of don't know what we ought to do, uh, and unbelief. Uh, I love uh, this definition of faith by William Lane Craig. He says, faith is a trust or commitment to what you think is true. Uh, so where do we find faith defined in the Bible? Well, we find it in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 13 tells us this. This is the great hall of faith and gives us tons of examples of faith being expressed in life. Hebrews 11 reads it this way. Uh, now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. 
Friends, you see the importance of everything starting with God's existence. I can't tell someone that the Bible is the word of God, if there's no God who exists to have a word. I can't talk about Jesus being the son of God, if there's no God who exists to have a son. And this is what faith is. Notice this being sure. So I hope to break uh, kind of maybe a, a false view of faith that we have. Being sure literally means a mental assurance. And there's three basic elements, knowledge, agreement, and trust. Now, the first uh, element of faith involves the mind. <clears throat> it entails more than knowledge, but it's like an understanding of, of what this means to a person. It's literally, I love knowledge, the definition of knowledge being that <clears throat> when the knower and what's to be known become one, there's an agreement that this is true. That second element of faith, right, when you have this agreement, it, it moves you forward to take action take action. Biblical faith is, is meaningless without trust. Now, trust is not just trusting in information. It's not informational, but it's relational. It is trust in the God who gave you this information. It is the object of our faith is God itself. Faith is it in faith. So where's knowledge uh, located if this is what the definition of faith is? Well, it's located in our minds. The bottom line is faith is not blind. We are. Blind faith is new age. It's found in some Eastern religions, but it's not Christianity. This, there's no such thing as blind faith from a Christian perspective. And here's how we really live our lives, kind of like practical atheists, if you will. So we have this false view of faith, and we have like these two categories as if faith and reason don't touch. Well, this is a secular view, and this is a false dichotomy between faith and reason. This is kind of called fideism. This is tied into the enlightenment. Actually, it goes back to Immanuel Kant, a philosopher, and that where there's faith and reason are kind of two categories and it never touch. Well, this faith is based on feelings. It's kind of more Oprah than Paul, if you will, and it's living without knowledge. But what did the definition of faith in the Bible include? It started with knowledge. True faith begins with truth. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of what? Of truth. Truth requires us to do actions. It's not the Holy Spirit of, the Holy Spirit isn't a force. He's a person. And he's giving us truth and it calls for action. So feeling center faith is more for Disney than it is divinity, friends. When faith is blind and we treat it that way, and there's no, no wonder so many of us are bound in the vice of uncertainty. I love what Martin Luther says, the famous, famous reformer, that uh, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant, the word of God, none else is worth believing. Spiritually blind men will always be uncertain. It is, re again, spiritually blind men will always be uncertain. This <clears throat> reminds me of a character in Doctor Who. So there was a character in Doctor Who, they're called the Headless Monks. And the Headless Monks were very religious. They believed so much in listening to their hearts rather than their minds that they beheaded themselves and they put their heads in this box-like device. And many of us walk into church like that, right? We walk around like headless monks. We put our brain on the shelf and then we live the rest of our life and we put our, our head back on as if God doesn't exist, as if God doesn't apply to our work life or apply to our family life or every other thing that we're doing. It applies in a big way. And then we head off, ready to battle the world without using our heads. And we wonder why there's no victory. <clears throat> this is why we live like practical atheists. Well, biblical view of faith is, is, is different. There's this, there's this partial overlap of faith and reason. This is the proper view of it. For example, not <clears throat> there are some truths that are truths of reason, some that are truths of faith. And then others are faith and reason overlapping. This is where we live most of our lives. For example, a truth of reason and not faith is one plus one plus one equals three. Or that you're here at Refuel today watching a presentation on the virtues. Now, there are truths of faith and not reason, such as God is a trinity. God is triune. Now, biblical faith never contradicts reason. Now, God is trinity is expressed mathematically one times one times one. In fact, I use this a lot with uh, my Muslim friends and witnessing to them. God's not one plus one plus one, that's three. He's one times one times one is one. 
Now, we most live our lives, like I said, in this faith reason kind of overlap. For example, tomorrow, when you tell your friend that you're at Refuel today, well, if he's your friend, he's going to have faith in you. Say, oh, great. Well, tell me about it. Well, it's not blind faith. He knows you. He has a relationship with you. He trusts you that you wouldn't lie to him about something like that. So silly. But if someone doesn't know, you say, well, what's Refuel? And you tell them about it. Well, what was the topic? Well, it was about, you know, uh, the virtue of faith. Well, who was there? We can ask Phil and Dave Ramos. They saw me there. They were online. So you're kind of gathering data and evidence. Wow. And you say, okay, more than likely you were at Refuel yesterday. Um, for example, marriage. I didn't just blindly marry my wife. I got to know her. I knew some things about her, felt that I could trust her and, and went forward to having a marriage with her. Court cases are based on faith and reason, putting the two together, using deductive reasoning, or and then abductive reasoning, which is reasoning to the best explanation. Um, security clearances and background investigations use faith and reason. Forensic science uses faith and reason. How do I know if it was a murder or a suicide? Uh, those types of things. Faith and reason is where we live most of our lives. <clears throat> now, Christian faith is a growth in faith. Again, this will change our, our, our thinking and impact how we think about life. This is why vir faith is a virtue and it's not a feeling because you're expected to do something with it. This is why we have commands such as Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, the word for transform there is metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis. Right. No wonder where many of us are kind of still crawling around on a branch and we can't get to the next next place is because we aren't renewing our minds. You can't know God's will without knowing God's voice. You can't know God's voice without knowing God's word. You'll never know God's specific purpose for your life without knowing his general will for your life as a child of a living God. <clears throat> this is also why God gives us warnings like like Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Well, why are you supposed to be aware of philosophy? We can't be aware of it without first being aware of philosophy. Well, what is worldly philosophy and, and how does it captivate us? Well, a lot of us get our worldview from, from movies, our storytelling mechanism, or books, or, or the university is our primary uh, place where we get uh, these uh, this worldly philosophy the philosophy today is a secular humanism is literally what's what's running our western world neo-marxism critical theory and all those types of things that's the target friends is our mind because if you get the way we think all of a sudden you inform our passions and it causes call, calls us to act in a certain way well god calls us to renew our minds if we don't then we end up having the problem like the early uh, religious leaders right they had zeal without knowledge. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason that bad philosophy needs to be answered. Well, this reminds me of when I first found out I needed glasses. I don't know if uh, some of you were like me. It was later on in life where I figured I needed glasses. I was driving home on 66 with a friend of mine. We were coming back from a comedy club and, and he looks at me and he's like, he, you know, 80s kid. So he dude bombs me. Dude, do you need glasses? I'm like, I don't need glasses. He said, are you sure? He said, here, put these on. This is, this is a light prescription. So I put these glasses on and I'm like, oh my God. I, I kept on putting them down and up, down and up. I had no clue how, how blurry the world was with around me. I know I got so used to it. And it wasn't until I had this moment of vision corrected correction that I realized that really I'm blind in some ways. Well, faith and reason provide clarity helps us to really see the world as God sees us. Now, Barna says that 93% of, of Christians don't have a biblical worldview. Only 7% of Christians do. Less than 50% uh, of pastors have a biblical worldview. So it's probably wise to assume that you might be one of the 93% and you have to do something about it. So what is the solution? Well, we need to level up. I used to love playing Call of Duty with my kids. Notice I said used to. I played a lot of games when I was younger, and I can't <clears throat> stick to it because I know I'll get addicted to playing games. But 
I love playing Call of Duty with them. And there's just something about, you know, your your nine year old daughter saying, booyah, headshot, you know, and taking you out, uh, you know, maybe something to do with my parenting there. But what I noticed is the more I leveled up, the better my weapons were, the better my weapons were, the more impact I made in the game and with the people around me. Well, the same is true with a biblical view of faith and our life do we have. Now, there are three levels of growth in this virtue of faith. And now that we have this kind of biblical understanding of what biblical faith is, it's not blind, it's faith and reason, faith and reason working together. Well, the first level is the content of our faith. Now, your enemy will keep you at this level, stop you from growing by keeping you in ignorance and unbelief. The reason most of us have unbelief is because our mind is filled with bad ideas. The process for gaining good content is erase and replace. This is what God's doing. I remember when I came to Christ, uh, it was 25, I came to Christ. I'm constantly putting all of my ideas and thoughts in every area of my life. Doesn't even matter. Everything, political, you name it. It was on the table and I picked it up anew with hands. I was shocked at how much I believed. And I really had no idea why I believed it. Well, it's because a lot of the worldview was kind of caught. I just assumed certain things were true. So it's critical to put yourself where God is. And uh, Dave, I loved and Dave Ramos in the last uh, uh, lesson used this idea of the, of the cell phone and the signal, right? We have to put our place where God's uh, cell reception is. We have to constantly be filling our minds with good content. This is the most important level. You can't skip the levels uh, or like, like games. There's no cheat codes. Uh, you can't just have the, the eight leaps of life. It's you don't pull up to make Jesus and, and ask for something, then drive up front and get it real quick. It's not, it's not that quick. It's constant renewing of your mind. Well, most Christians get very little content. We do a little bit of a Sunday feeding. We might show up, say, to like a refuel or something else, kind of when we feel like it. We get very, very little. We got to fill our mind with God's ideas. We got to be around God's people. Uh, we got to volunteer. We got to choose to grow. Personal Bible study, getting our questions answered. Uh, small groups, uh, avoiding uh, false teachers in this milk toast type stuff, right? You don't want to live. What if you just filled your body with sugar, right? You don't want to live constantly on sugar. We don't want to fill your your soul with you know sugary kind of uh, every day is a Friday kind of teaching. That's not going to do anything for you. Uh, add some worship music uh, to your to your library. You got to constantly add new content. And once you have that new content, you move forward to that second level, which is conviction. Now, this is where God challenges you to make a decision. Uh, your enemy here, my friend, is pride. Pride will get in the way in a big way. At this level, right, those morsels of truth from the content start making its way into your heart, start breaking down, and you find these former beliefs challenged, and it can be uncomfortable. Too many men will not make the tough call because they won't let those beliefs be challenged. Now, conviction is not an opinion. An opinion you carry, but a conviction carries you. It's what moves you to act in a certain way. Most people will know what you believe by your reaction more than your action, because your reaction tells you what you believe is true, because you just react from it naturally. This conviction is, is critical. This is when you decide if you're going to submit to God or play God in your life. The godly man wants to believe God. He'll begin to distrust his former beliefs, seek answers as to like, well, why does God say what he says? And you just learn to trust him, that God knows best. And this is where apologetics comes in. This is where you, you start really getting your questions answered. You start challenging those former beliefs. Why are you doubting God in this area? There is a belief that you're holding on to, whether you're aware of it or not, that is you are assuming is true. This is a critical step. So a good example of this is when uh, Cheryl and I were living together and sleeping together, I get saved. We were both reading God's word. Here we are at Hebrews 13, 4, says that, um, that God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. You know, I'm sitting there kind of out of my shirt. I'm wondering, hmm, I wonder what that, you know, I wonder how that works. And I wonder why God says what he says. And I just had this sense in my heart, obey first and your feelings will follow. And I yelled over to Cheryl, hey, so what you think of the reading this morning? She's like, hmm, we got to talk about that. Well, I didn't know why God says what he said. I just knew he said it. I had a decision to make. 
I'm the man, I had the lead. So we went out and we, we spent some time together. I said, you know what? I don't know what, why God says what he says, but he says it. he has a boundary for a reason, not because he's a cosmic killjoy, but because he loves us. We need to obey first and then we'll figure out why he says what he says later. Our feelings will follow that. We made a commitment. We had a year to go, my friends, before we got married because we both kind of came from, from no money. So we were saving. And then eventually I moved out and we set that boundary because we, we had a conviction about it, made a decision. And all of a sudden, this biblical worldview started getting shaped in this area of sexuality. And that leads us to that third level, which is centrality. All of a sudden, God was central to our lives in that area. It was fully submitted and given to him. This third level, the centrality of faith is everything. The more areas of your life that you move through content and conviction and you make these virtuous calls, these hard calls and say, you know what, Christ, I trust you on this. The more you do that, the more and more you start expressing Christ in your everyday life. At this level, your worldview is absolutely driven from a biblical perspective. The more you do this, all of a sudden your default moves from just uncertainty to faith. You just naturally trust God because you have more experiences with him. So to if you don't, then your result to find his path will be nearly impossible. That's why we have Romans 12 too. The more central belief is, the more your desires will be moved toward that belief system. This is key. This is absolutely key. You got to work through these levels and God and sovereignty will give you, if you will, new mods and map updates. <laughs> you have new places to go, more places to explore. Uh, but I'll tell you what, if you stay at level one, God or the enemy will take you out and you'll respawn in those same situations until you learn that lesson that God wants you to learn. It'll be like the movie, uh, Bill Murray, the Groundhog Day. You'll get up. It'll be the same day, same battle because you haven't learned. And God's guess what he's breaking. The backbone of pride is what he is breaking. You got the content. It hit your heart and conviction. And you said, nope. You got the content. It hit your heart and conviction. You said, nope. The more you do that, friends, you will stay, as my teenagers would say in gaming, you would stay a noob don't stay a noob. God doesn't want you to constantly be drinking milk 20 years later in your Christian walk. So there's these levels, right? The content of faith, the conviction of faith, the centrality of faith. This is a constant area, constant movement that you have to do, friends. It is key to do this, to work through these levels in your life. That is unless you consider to, you know, continue to be, uh, embrace this uh, false uh, faith reason dichotomy uh, you'll, you'll never get anywhere your feelings have to be driven by your faith by what you think is true that's what drives you friends now notice here if i have you see this little p i have so you see under level one i have the p knowledge and i tell you how to get more content right bible study sermons classes that present new ideas you have to it's your relationship with god you have to constantly grow in this area well, those little P's are the virtue of prudence. So remember, I told you that, that prudence and faith share this property of wisdom. We're going to talk about this next week. The growth in prudence is, is through knowledge and understanding and wisdom. So that second is understanding, right? You start taking what's true. You start noodling through it. You start challenging your ideas and going, you know what, God, I'm moving. I'm going in that way. This is having a teachable spirit. A teachable spirit is a reachable spirit. A teachable spirit is a reachable spirit. You need humility, and this starts changing your mind. Wisdom, right? That's that, that uh, root word is skill. It's in a skill. You become an apprentice of, of, of Christ, if you will. You have to apply God's word through obedience, and this ends up changing your life. You have to constantly work through these things. Wisdom, again, is that shared property between faith and prudence, and I don't think it's an accident. I, don't, I think that's what discipleship is all about. It is time for us to level up. We have to be level three Christians in multiple areas of our life. That's what God wants of us. The more we do that, the more impact we can make in the impact zone gives us with our starting with our, our family and our friends and moving out. We will make that impact. It'll just, it'll just come through us. I promise you. 
that will start changing our affections, right? To where faith becomes a lot more natural. We just trust God and go, trust God and go. And then he'll hit us with a new challenge. You go, hmm. And our faith will get challenged and our ideas will get challenged. We have to constantly walk in obedience. That's a key. Changing uh, our life by, by, by obedience and by seeing what God's word has to say about these uh, areas is critical. That first question will become central to you. you know, what does God require of me? What does God require of me? Will become a natural way of talking about life. <clears throat> so in order to grow, I want to give you a couple uh, resources. Do you have, do you have a, a budget? For those of you who like <clears throat> budgeting, you know, to the, to the Nats penny, <clears throat> do you have a budget for growth? What's your growth budget for this year? Are you going to grow? The Big Book of Bible Difficulties is an excellent resource that every man should have in their library. Uh, it's one of my heroes in faith, Dr. Norman Geisler, who's my seminary professor. It goes from Genesis to Revelation. It literally covers all the tough uh, uh, Bible verses, it gives multiple views and talks about uh, why this view is correct versus the other ones. It is fantastic. Every library should have it. And then off in the far right, I have tons of question books. I, I love this stuff. Uh, this is the best question book out there. It's basically a, a, a big resource of, of there's seven or eight apologists dealing with a hundred different questions uh, of the faith. Key for renewing your mind is a critical resource. It's very, very uh, good book, covers tons of topics about how we got the Bible, a little bit of philosophy, uh, science, uh, world religions, covers so many topics. And then um, hugged by those two big uh, uh, brain books is, is mine. Now, some of you, I saw, you know, you, you picked up a copy of the book that like, that's great. It is not a, a simple read. I'll tell you that it is not, you know, this, this eight lives, you know, leaps of life in this little uh, simple topics is literally meant to be a training book. Tons of footnotes where I provide lots of detailed information, questions uh, that you stop at. Do you start unpacking? I'm trying to make you kind of dig into your heart on what you believe and, and, and why and those types of things. That's really the purpose of that. Also, some podcasts, you know, redeem your driving time. Hey, we live in Washington, D.C. For those of us who are still driving in or if you're sitting at home uh, working on something, put on a great podcast, a great Christian podcast. You learn all kinds of things. Um, there, there's great podcasts out there. Uh, resources are on the web. Um, gotquestions.org has great little uh, summaries of, of questions. You could look up topics. Evolutionnews.org is my favorite uh, science blog. It's uh, lots of ID scientists uh, dealing with topics that come up in the, in, in the, in the media constantly. Uh, Reasonablefaith.org. I read the question a week and I listen to his podcast every day. That's Dr. William Lane Craig, the best debater, uh, Christian philosopher out there. And then I have a site, one year Bible site.wordpress.com, where I took a few hundred people from McLean Bible when I was on staff there through uh, the one year Bible. And I just kind of have difficult passages I kind of unpacked and, and jumped into. But friends, no matter what, you have to grow. It's a choice you have to make. Uh, we, a lot of us, you know, went to college, have advanced degrees. Then we, when we, we show up at church, we want like a sixth grade type education. Friends, you'll never grow that way. The ideas that you grabbed in college will control your life. And you end up throwing crosses around them and baptizing them. And that's syncretism. And we don't want to do that. Uh, we need to grow in our faith, and that's how we